Today we're working on a clone of the Neumann U87, a favorite workhorse mic of the professional studio. I'll assume for most people watching this, the U87 needs no introduction. If you've ever recorded in a professional studio anytime in the last four decades, there's a good chance that a pair of U87s were used on the drum overheads or somewhere else in the session. It's a very versatile mic, great on acoustic guitar, hand percussion, room ambience, and it works well on some vocalists. In a pinch, it could be used on just about any source, given judicious placement in a good sounding room, thanks to its three polar patterns. Today, we're building a vintage style cologne based most closely on the 1980 version of the schematic. Now, this is a project that would have been beyond the realm of possibility for most DIYers just a few short years ago. Historically, the manufacturing know-how of the large diaphragm condenser capsule was confined to the locus of West Germany and Austria. So precision machined capsules weren't readily available to hobbyists, and neither were the standardized set of inexpensive donor bodies that we have access to today. Traditionally, home studios relied on more affordable dynamic mics, but as digital brought the cost of recording down, lower cost condensers eventually came along to meet the demand. Audio-Technica was the first large diaphragm condenser to break the $1,000 price point in the early 90s. Fast forward to today, and Chinese-made condenser mics can be had for $100, and sometimes even less than that. As a side note, though, it wasn't impossible to build a condenser, just more difficult. There is a freely available tube mic project with full schematic and parts list that was released by Giraffe Studios in 2002 called the G7, but only recently are we seeing ready to assemble projects that can be built in a single day. The one we're using here is one from microphoneparts.com. The nice thing about this one is that it doesn't have parts inside of it. And most importantly, it's not branded with some goofy brand name that you're gonna have to paint over or fill with Bondo. The ingredient list for this build, a body, and mic capsule. Both of these come from microphone-parts.com. Printed circuit boards from Danny Bouchard. He sells um, boards for reproduction, U87s, and several other Neumann models. And his website is vintagemicrophonepcbkit.com. An output transformer from Cinemag. And approximately $19.20, well, actually, exactly $19.22 worth of components for the circuit board. By the way, that amount can vary wildly depending on which parts you choose. I went with very high quality but reasonably priced parts, and that's what the total came to on my bill of materials. Before we even begin soldering parts, we'll go over the kit and prep it for a smooth assembly. This will pave over some of the snags that we'll encounter later on down the line and help move the build along quickly. First, you'll want to check the mounting holes on your donor body of choice and make sure they line up. The circuit boards from Danny come in two varieties to fit the two most common form factors, a rectangularish version and a tapered version, which is what I'm using for this particular body. So you'll want to choose your donor body before ordering a board set. Then be sure the FET isolation pin will fit through the PCB hole. Danny has a parts list on his site, and if you use the pin specified in that list, you're good to go. That particular part was out of stock when I ordered, so I sourced a different part, which was slightly cheaper, but it didn't fit the hole. It's slightly larger, specifically 3 seconds of an inch. So we'll quickly whip out the drill press and widen the hole. and check to be sure that the part fits, and it does in this case perfectly. Next, check the wires from the polar pattern selection switch. They need to come down to this point on the board. And on this particular body, they're not quite long enough. So let's just extend them now before we even begin stuffing the boards. I chose to splice a few extra inches of wire to the ends. It probably looked neater to redo the full length from one continuous wire but I think the switch contacts would be kind of hard to solder to without disassembling the top plate. Probably more hassle than it's worth. This way will be faster and equally reliable. It's no real compromise other than the aesthetics of it. 
So we do a quick strip, twist on a new section of wire and solder. We repeat this for all three wires, apply a little heat shrink to keep the electrons in and longer wires. Finally, we'll just make sure that the capsule will fit in the head basket. The stock opening on this body is sufficiently big for most of my capsules, but the U87 capsule is unique in that instead of having a single shared backplate, each diaphragm has its own backplate. So there's two backplates separated by a non-conductive membrane to electrically isolate the two halves. So two diaphragms, two backplates, four wires instead of three. This makes the capsule ever so slightly thicker than say a U67 capsule. The webpage for the body kit warns of this situation. The RK87 is about one millimeter too wide to fit through the neck of the head basket. This is easily remedied with a metal file. It only takes a few minutes. Scrub it down, knock out the filings. At this point, I just decided to attach the mount and the capsule and tuck it away safely in the head basket before doing the other wiring. Detailed capsule installation information and precautions are documented at microphoneparts.com slash capsule hyphen installation. At this point, there's nothing left to do but stuff the boards and attach the wires. And if you're like me, you'll be surprised at how fast that goes. At some point, I found myself staring at the board wondering what to do next, and I realized, oh, I'm done. Then you just attach the circuit boards, hook up the output transformer, and calibrate. And at that point, you really are done. It's a good idea to probably use the recommended quick disconnect headers, especially if you anticipate repeated disassembly for troubleshooting. I opted to direct connect with hookup wires. There are four wires that go between the two boards. They're labeled A, B, C, and G. A on one board goes to double A on the other, B to double B, C to double C, and the green wire to double G is longer. It's the one that goes to the isolation pin and has slightly farther to travel. Leave yourself enough room to comfortably work between the boards if you need to reach in there and cut leads or do any rework. The noise shield included with the body kit is all that's needed for mounting the transformer, which will stay firmly in place just from the stiffness of the wires. Thread the XLR wires through one top hole and the transformer's wires through the other and tighten down the noise shield. The silkscreen designation for the pads where you hook up the transformer follow the original Neumann schematic, which makes them somewhat cryptic. Everything else on the board is completely self-explanatory, but I had to stop to look this up, so I'll explain what's happening here. The pads are labeled WS, BL, SW, and RT, which as it turns out are the Deutsch abbreviations for the wire colors on the original transformer, which is no longer available. WS is Weiss, which is Deutsch for white. BL is Blau. SW is Schwartz, or if you want to be authentic, that would be Schwarz. Schwarz. And RT is Rot. Obsolete color schemes aside, this translates into secondary high, secondary low, primary low, and primary high. Or in the case of the Cinemag CM2480, yellow, orange, brown, and red. Now we're in the home stretch. One resistor left. And the value of that remaining resistor is dependent on the tolerance of the passive components and the gain of your transistor in circuit. And that is what you'll figure out in this procedure. So temporarily, we'll patch in a variable resistor, in other words, a trim pot, and tweak it until the voltage on the drain of the FET reads between 11 and 11 and a half volts. Make sure to use a 25 turn trim pot to allow you to just creep up on that value. I originally tried this with a single turn pot, and the adjustment was just too coarse to really hit the spot with any kind of accuracy or repeatability. I used a mini alligator clip to monitor the drain, attaching it to one probe of my multimeter. And I also used alligator clips to patch my trim pot into the circuit. The other probe of your multimeter will connect to a ground point on the PCB, and then you'll just adjust the trimmer to taste. Once you're between 11 and 11 and a half volts, simply disconnect and measure the resistance that you just dialed in. 
At that point, you'll find a resistor that matches that value in a non-varying state.